Hello and welcome to the Thunder Basketball Universe. We're here inside Paycom Center and it is Thursday, March 28th. We're coming off that road home back-to-back, -back, a really tough one for the Thunder, but a, a good one on the front end, that big time victory over the New Orleans Pelicans on the road and then an overtime loss to the Houston Rockets at home. I've got our great friend Michael Cage here alongside me, the analyst for our Bally Sports Oklahoma TV broadcast. Michael, always great to have you. Thanks for coming in. My pleasure. My pleasure. Well, well Michael, the Thunder uh, had this amazing win on on uh, Tuesday night down in New Orleans. Um, it was a back and forth battle with a, a, a Pelicans team that had just been playing uh, very, very well lately. OKC gets down late and then zooms out to this 12-0 run to end the game. Uh, what did what stood out to you about the finish to that game and kind of the, the resilience that this team had to show down the stretch of that game? Probably the biggest thing I would say is uh, how they just all locked arms. It takes more than just one guy to make something happen like that on the road, end of a long East Coast road trip, uh, you know, trying to, to, to realizing what was at stake that night. I know we're going to talk about that a little bit later, so I won't even mention it. I'll say that surprise. <laughs> Getting everybody to just like focus for a stretch in the game, being one of the youngest teams in the NBA – I was impressed that they locked arms, held together, got stops on the road. And that was a hostile crowd. I don't know if yeah. you remember. Yeah. Big they time. were booing the refs. They were booing us. They, you know, they were booing me. I said, look, I'm not playing. I'm done. I've been ready to put in my 15 years. I've heard enough <laughs> booze, so leave me alone. They, they were booing me. <laughs> so, you know, when you see a young team like that really kind of hold on to the rope and just not let go and say, look, you know what? We were up 20 and, and all of a sudden we're down five with – 2.47 to go in the fourth quarter, late, and the crowd is all excited. Zion is being Zion, yeah. and all of a sudden the gong goes off. I, I was really impressed with a number of things that happened. There was a little bit of extra juice in that building, and you have to remember the Thunder went down to New Orleans and beat them last year in the first play-in game, and you could – Feel that maybe yeah. there was a little bit of Is still. Is that why the crowd extra, was so hostile? I, I felt like maybe there was a little yeah. something still there, and obviously, you know, some really intense battles that these two teams have had so far this year as well, uh, including the Thunder going into their house earlier this season and having probably one of the Thunder's best wins of the whole year. So, uh, as you pointed out, the way that this Thunder team locked arms late was able to go on that 12-0 run to finish the game held Zion without even a shot attempt in the final three and a half minutes of that game. And part of the reason was just the way that the Thunder was able to be creative late. Mark Dagnall is always, he's always keeping people on his toes. And he goes and makes a switch defensively, puts Lou Dort on Zion Williamson. Prior to that, it had mostly been J-Dub defending Zion. Dort had been on C.J. McCollum. They flipped that matchup. What impact do you think that had down the stretch? I, I think... More or less, the two coaches, Willie Green mm -hmm. and Mark Dagonal, was playing a game of chess. And you remember in the second half, they didn't start their starting center, right. Jonas Valanciunas. In fact, he didn't even play the entire second half. So I was like, going, okay, something's going on here. And Mark just said, look, you know what? I'm just going to keep switching people up on Zion because, you know, folks, he's a beast. He is just, I don't know, there's no player like him in the league with the grace and power and skills that he has attacking the basket, that if you don't put your work in early with him, that guy will bounce you off him and get an and one all night long. So watching J-Dub, Lou, and Chet all try to you know defend him, you could see at the end there when Mark made that his final chess move defensively, uh, you know, I saw I saw a different Zion standing out there going, wait a minute, if you give me the ball away from the basket, I can't get around this guy because he's about as big as I am. He's just shorter. But with the other guys, I could quickly get around him because I'm dribbling past half court. I got a full head of steam. I thought that was a big, big adjustment that a lot of coaches don't get credit for in the heat of the moment, you know, especially when you know any minute now they can go bigger when they br bring Jonas back into the game. But when they came back, the, the Pelicans, from a 20-point deficit with that small ball that we were using, all of a sudden, Willie Green stuck with it, and that was when Mark Dagnall made his move. It's so interesting that you pointed out the, the Valanciunas move also because the Thunder basically forced Willie Green into doing that. I mean, this is the problem that Chet Holmgren has been presenting to defenses all season long. They cannot put a traditional big out there on the floor with him, and so teams are sort of scrambling uh, to try to deal with that. Yeah, I, I thought that was really the key because, uh, first of all, when you got a big like Valanchunas and you got him on the floor with Zion, that's a power matchup. Mm -hmm. And I thought that the Thunder won that battle. Yep. 
They struggled on Sunday afternoon against Milwaukee, but they won the battle, the rebounding battle, the points in the paint battle, the transition point battles. Keep in mind, the Thunder were up 15 at halftime. And if I'm Willie Green, I'm doing exactly what he did. I'm going, I'm scratching my head. I'm going, I've got to do something because we're down 15. We're at home. We've been playing great basketball. You know, how did, how did they do it? And he probably realized that we were faster, we were quicker, but more or less we had shooters on the perimeter that could knock down shots, including Chet. And, and you know, Jonas is one of those guys, like most big men, they're kind of apprehensive about closing out hard on a shooter because they don't want to get driven by and dunked on. I was the same way when I played. <laughs> I'd rather give you the three than have you blow by me and dunk on me because that's that's like, you know, that hurts the pride. So it stuck, you know, we stuck with what we did and Willie Green stuck with what they did and it worked for a minute. So I really like the fact that Chet, you know, he's unusual for a rookie, folks. Um, and I've said it, I have to sometimes remind myself this is his rookie season. You know, he's averaging almost 17 points a game. He's one of the top shot blockers in the league. And God knows how many shots he changes on a night-to-night -night basis that the NBA just doesn't keep up with. You know, I've seen, I've seen, guys, like, I got to bring it. Can I bring that up about the dunk attempt Absolutely. by Trey, yeah. uh, Trey Murphy the third? That dunk has was been played all over every social media platform, <laughs> ESPN, Bally Sports, you name it, because very few players in the league can block a shot like that. That guy's up in the air and he's cocking it back like this is gonna be, you know, a highlight of my my life. I'm gonna energize this crowd. Chet meets him at the apex and brings him to the floor. That's Chet Holmgren. Chet's got as many blocks as he does fouls all season long. It's, it's a very rare category to be in of guys that can say that in this league. I can't say that either. <laughs> but yeah, it's true. I, just, I thought you never fouled. I never fouled, but I, I always had more <laughs> attempted calls that I thought were unfair you know, than I did, you know, in terms of my, my, my turnovers or, you know, just the impact that. You look at a guy like him, it's more than just the rim protection. It's what you brought up about the three-point shooting. You know, his ability to get the ball and go coast to coast like butter and toast. I mean, I'm watching him at seven foot one, get a rebound and sprint up the middle of the floor. He's smart because he knows if you're a big guy, you're running a fast break. You don't want to run along the wings because they can trap you. They can come up behind you and you have no escape route. Chet always brings it up the middle. I love that. He's a smart player. Well, that five-out style, the fact that the Thunder has guys up and down the roster that can play make and that they can put five guys out there to do that at the same time, that's been the formula all season. That game in New Orleans, that marked the Thunder's 50th win of the year. That is the eighth time in the 16 seasons here of Thunder basketball that the Thunder has had 50 wins or the equivalent of 50 wins in a couple shortened seasons. Michael, can you put that in perspective for us? Because that is tied for the most of any team in that time span since the Thunder came here in 2008. Well, man, that's a, that's a good question, first of all. I played 15 seasons in the NBA. I only had two 50-win seasons. That's, that's a lot remarkable. of lonely 13, year, 13 years. And you played on some good teams, some, some really, really good really teams. really good teams. And so to see that done, what, six times? Eight. Eight times. Eight times in 16 seasons. So that's remarkable. half the time that people have been able to witness Thunder basketball, this this team has put itself in elite category, which is a 50-win season. Then, then let me point something else out, too. We're one of the youngest teams in the league. We have one of the youngest starting lineups in the league, and they've experienced a 50-win season already. Shea, you know, your lead guy out there, he's 25. You know, uh, J-Dub, he's 22. Chet, he's 21. Josh, he's 21. Uh, you got all these young guys experiencing this with this organization so young. That's a great platform. That's a great launch pad for understanding how to win. And it's not like, it's not like those 50 wins this year have been front-loaded or back-loaded or home-loaded. No, they've won on the road with 23 wins, and they've won at home with 28. So you're, you're talking about a, a young team that's learned how to play on the road and win in tough places and then you know, at the same time, protect the home court. That's really unique. And for context, the Thunder's average age in its starting lineup is exactly the same as the UNC Tar Heels. You know, we're talking about a little bit of March Madness here oh, man, in a little bit. Mind. But you isn't that crazy? I mean, these are, just... these, these are kids out there on the floor. And so it's just remarkable if you think back to maybe what your expectations might have been of this Thunder team back in October and think about now where this squad is at. You got to think. Everything from here on out is gravy because, you know, to hit the 50 win mark yeah. when you're, you're coming in as one of the, the, I think the second youngest team in the league yeah. is just outstanding. And, yeah. and, and so that's why, Michael, you're going to have in the course of an 82 game season, you're going to have a night like last night as well. 
you know, right. second night of a back to back. The road home back to backs, those are really we, tough. We had quite a few too this yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. And and so the Houston Rockets, who were the hottest team in the league coming into town, they had won nine straight games. The Thunder is without Shea Gildas Alexander. He's got that thigh contusion. Uh, we'll see. Mark said that they're going to continue to kind of evaluate him day to day. Mark Dagnalt said that uh, the Thunder head coach. Michael, so last night, the Thunder, they, they come up short. It's a it's a 132-126 overtime loss, just haymakers being thrown all over the place. I wanted to get your rapid-fire reaction to three plays that we saw last night that, uh, for me, they blew my mind, but I wanted to see if you had any experience, context that you could put behind it. The first one, all right. the rim-rocking, best poster that I've seen all season long, Isaiah Joe, Cocking back for a one-handed lefty poster dunk over Jeff Green. Did you ever imagine it in your wildest dream? <laughs> I mean, in my wildest dream, did I, could I ever do something like Could I ever see someone doing something like that in live? In fact, when it happened, and Jeff Green, you know, nice guy. Yeah. He just should have got out of that restricted area sooner. Because, <laughs> you know, when I see a guy rising up, I'm, I'm backing up, and I back out of the picture. And the coach says, Cage, you didn't contest the shot. No, no, I, I knew what was going to happen. But with Isaiah Joe – Giving up five or six inches to the six foot nine, you know, Jeff Green, man, that was beautiful. I, I really thought that was probably one of the dunks of the NBA season, yep. in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, just a power dunk. And the cool thing about Isaiah, you know, he's a right handed shooter, but he dunks left handed. And so this is something that I've talked to him about over the course of time. He said when he was back in middle school, he was on the track team. And he found out that he's a better, you know, jumping off one leg, he's a better jumper off of his right leg than he is off of his left leg. He gets more power, gets more vertical out of it. And so, you know, when you when you go up for a dunk or a layup, you're supposed to jump off of your opposite leg right. of what you're shooting with. So he basically just turned it into a craft. He realized, okay, yeah. I'm better off my right leg. So when I go up to dunk, I'm going to slam that thing through lefty. I think and I know you yeah. got to appreciate that as a, as oh, a lefty. I do, especially, but he just does it better than I do. <laughs> and I'm a true left-hander. But you know what? Some great players have mastered that art. Very yeah. few. I think about Phil Mickelson, the golfer who's right-handed, you know, but golf's left. Amazing golfer. Yeah. And then I look at guys like, you know, uh, Isaiah Joe, who we've learned over the class, the last couple of seasons, just how really good he is at launching off that right foot. Because, you know, he's a terrific three-point shooter yeah. and he's shown that he can play in the mid-range. And then when you see him elevate like he did last night, Man, I, I just – I forgot that I was a broadcaster. I just said, whoa. <laughs> and I said, that was whoa, word. Yeah. Can I say that on TV? You know, I, I lost my mind. That's how exciting it was. <laughs> All right, next play, J-Dub, Jalen Williams, game-tying three to send this thing into overtime. You know, the Thunder looked like it maybe just run out a little bit of gas. Chet Holmgren had fouled out. The shot-making from the Rockets was out of control. J-Dub hits that three. What's going through your mind? I'm saying to myself, can you arrive twice in your career <laughs> – because I'm like going, what is the what is the ceiling for him? Yeah, you know, you imagine the, the 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 confidence it takes to take that shot with pressure on you, and and they know you're going to take that shot because they've seen how good he is in the fourth quarter, and he takes that shot and he hits the dead center of the rim. I look at sometimes I look at our team and how they react, and I look quickly at the coaches down here for the opposing team. I saw Willie Green do this. His like, <laughs> I told you he was going to do that. Well, you got to do it first. Okay. But that was, you know, it just let me know that the times when Shea is with us and he's off the floor, J-Dub has learned to be the playmaker, uh, the, the gravity guy, you know, the, the, the take charge of the floor guy until Shea's comes back. And he's learned to play that way with him. To me, for a second year player, hard to do. Because it's, it's just, you know, when we're in our second season, it's, it's, it's called your sophomore season. And the word sophomore by nature, Latin word means wise fool. He has avoided that. <laughs> that is awesome. I didn't avoid Michael. it. I didn't know that. <laughs> I did not avoid I did not avoid that. I was like, well, come on, coach. Just give me the ball, man. Stop holding me back. You don't know. No. Jada waits. He's smart. You know, I think the three years in college really helped yeah. him because physically he's there, mentally he's there. And he's been playing with this great player in Shea. And he's learned a lot. And he says he's been in that lab in the summer with a pen and a pad. With you know, with that that white coat on, and he is just showing you, he's just really receiving the fruits of his labor right now. And he's done it with such grace in the sense that he hasn't forced anything. I mean, he plays within the team concept. As he's 
gotten more responsibility put on his shoulders in terms of you know the yeah. things that every player wants, That's the ball in his hands, the yeah. scoring opportunities. He hasn't let go of the rope at all defensively and with his responsibility as a playmaker. Uh, you know, more than, yeah. you know, I think two thirds of his games recently, yeah. he's got five or more assists. I mean, he just continues to play make. I think he's learned that uh, in a short amount of time, because, you know, he, he's only, what, in his second season, that too much is given, much is required. Mm -hmm. And a lot of young guys don't know how to stop shooting, <laughs> they don't know how to stop dribbling either. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they don't know how to stop doing all these things that, that, you know, a lot of times that hey, I, you need, I need you to do more to get us going. I know you can rebound, Cage. I know, but I need you to do something else. J Dub, I know you can drive, but I need to show you can shoot to three. I need to show you can a pass, throw those amazing lobs. Right. You know, I need to see that you can do that. He's understood, I guess, that philosophy that uh, yeah, too too much is given, that much is required, and he's met those expectations at time this year, and and in my opinion, has exceeded them. Yep. And, and the last play I wanted to touch on was the most ridiculous acrobatic play that wasn't a dunk. And it was Josh Giddy scoring from his back with the shot clock dwindling down. Wow. This guy, Josh, you know, he's he's surged here yeah. in March. I mean, just incredible efficiency, well up above you know, 55 percent shooting from the field, 40 percent from three in the month of March. And has taken great strides in what's been, you know, a challenge of a season for him as teams have continued to adjust. And so he's really leaned into his shot diet, but he's still shown us that magic that he's got to his game. Sometimes, you know, we see it with the passing with just wizard, wizardry, right. but then you see it with a shot like that too, off of his back. Well, let me start with this saying, and then I'll kind of speak from this. It was a shot from the land down under. <laughs> oh. Nice, nice. Okay. Our Australian <laughs> reference here for our guy, Josh Giddy. I haven't seen that in a game where I've been a part of. And and I said it on the air last night, to have the presence of mind, shot clock winding down. You remember, if he tries to pass that ball out or roll it out, shot clock violation. Yep. But instead, he's on his back and he looks up at the rim and does a little toss. Because, you know, you talked about mm -hmm. that wizardry with the basketball. The shot goes in. And once again, it's a shot heard around the world because when I woke up this morning, they weren't really talking about it. it was a double overtime game. I mean, a single overtime game. They were talking about, we got to show, we got to start the show with this shot by Josh Giddy, And he was chased. You remember? He yeah. was being chased. And then he dove on the floor for the ball to get it and then turn over on his back to avoid. A lot of things were happening, you know, moving parts in that one play alone. He moved away from the defender to stop them from getting the jump ball. He like literally ripped it back and then took the shot before the shot clock and it tied the game. <laughs> I was like going, the kid is in the moment, man. He he has, and to, to your point, he has been in the moment. He has waited for those moments when, you know, he can do those sort of things. Not mm -hmm. just that, but his passing. How yeah, about his, his attacking Fred Bland Fleet last night? Yep. Bumping yep. him, bumping him and getting that nice little floater. He's doing it over a lot of different uh, defenders. And it's not just a small sample size. He's been doing that for a, a big stretch of games. We'll let you know that's the consistency of Josh Giddy right now. He had a really good quote last night. He said, we're a winning team. I'm in a really good place. I've got great people around me. You're going to have ebbs and flows throughout the course of a, a, as a career or as a season, as a young player. And it's all about just managing it and sticking together through the highs and the lows. And I thought that was great perspective from a guy who, you know, could have gotten sucked into some of the lows that he's had this year or could be pounding his chest when he's having a, a high moment right now. Well, I, I think it speaks for how mentally tough he is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being an NBA player, I'm just going to say you got to be mentally tough. If you're not, some player, some fan, some situation that you've been put in is going to take away your confidence or it's going to bring you more confidence. And I think Josh is one of those guys, he's not afraid to meet those, if you will, expectations. I know that's the mother of disappointment, but we all have that, you know. And he's avoided a lot of that and stayed I think system basketball, you don't see him running around outside of the system and you're going, what is he doing? No, yeah. he's always in the middle of the floor because he knows that's the, that's the, he's most dangerous in the middle of the floor being an excellent passer because he can throw the lob. He can, he can take that little floater. He can, you know, uh, pat, kick out to shooters. Or if you're going to just what I call load up the paint, he's been knocking down that three. So uh, th that's all about his IQ. And, you know, it's six foot eight, man, uh, third season in the league. Um, he's unique. I, I don't know if you can call him a unicorn because you always say that's a seven footer with those kind of descriptions. But, you know, in my opinion, Josh Giddy is a unicorn. 
there, I, I can't think of, can you think of any other six foot eight point guard that's in the league right now? There's, it's just, there's not many. No. And, and you know, he's not even going to turn 22 until October. And so he's going to be still younger than some of these guys that are going to get drafted here coming up in June. Our very own Paris Lawson had a chance to sit down with Josh uh, for an extended one-on-one. Uh, take a listen to what our guy from Down Under had to say. We are now joined by Josh Giddy, the one and only. Josh, thanks so much for being here. No problem, Paris. Thank you for having me. How you doing? Doing good. Uh, third media day, so yeah. I, mean, I feel like a vet around here now, but um, it's a lot of fun. Josh, uh, one of the highlights of my offseason was getting a chance to go to Melbourne, experience Melbourne for the first time. But it wasn't even the city. It was learning about Australian basketball in general. Mm -hmm. The shuffle offense was the most interesting thing to me. I can't stop thinking about yeah. it. For those who don't know, can you tell us about the shuffle offense? Yeah. Um, the shuffle offense is, is something that was very big in the junior team that I used to play for, uh, the Melbourne Tigers. Um, started a long time before I was around. And uh, my dad, he, he used to run it with his team. It was a very simple offensive system. And um, he, he taught it to me and my teammates growing up all through our junior careers. And um, it, it was just a way to... Uh, we, we used to run it every time down the floor, and there's a lot of different looks you can get out of it. And um, he taught it as good as anyone I've ever been around. And um, I think that's where a lot of my passing comes from in that offense. There was a lot of um, you know back cuts and slips and different reads I had to make. And um, the shuffle offense is, in my opinion, I think if an NBA team was to run it, no one would be able to guard it. But um, that's just not how the NBA is played these days. But uh, I think that offense is, is very, very good. It seems like the Thunder, though, incorporates elements of it into your y'all style of play. Mm -hmm. What sort of things are kind of paralleled with the Thunder and kind of the shuffle offense? Yeah, I think we, we typically have a lot of cutting, um, and the shuffle is, is all revolves around ball movement and cutting and screening, and um, and there's a lot of different looks you can get out of it. And um, our offense is, is, is similar in that sense where um, there's not just one look on a play. There's different multiple different options that, that the – you know, the handler or the screener can, can make the read on. And um, and coach puts us in, because we've got a lot of guys that can handle the ball out there, coach puts us in positions where, um, you know, we're engaged, even if we don't have the ball in our hands, as a cutter, as a screener, whatever it is. Um, so that aspect is very similar to the shuffle and, and how I grew up playing. So um, it's good to kind of, makes me feel like I'm back at home a little bit. A little bit, a, yeah. little, a little reminiscent. You mentioned that that's where you got a lot of your passing from. As the team's offense gets better and improves over the course of seasons, do you feel like you can make more simple passes now and, and not have to make so many of those kind of daring passes that you, you used to make? Yeah, I mean, I think that comes with time. And, and the more we all get on the same page, um, those daring passes do become the simple pass. And um, and for me, I, I like to play on the edge a little bit. It's just how I've always played. And um, I'm fortunate enough that, you know, Mark gives me that freedom to kind of go out there. And sometimes, you know, I have to tone back the turnovers a little bit. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm just glad I have teammates and coaches that, that trust me to make the right play. And um, although sometimes it does result in turnovers and um, I definitely hear about it. But, um, yeah, as I said, I think the, the longer we start playing, uh, keep playing together, sorry, um, the, those passes that look tough in my first, second year, they, they become the normal. And, um and, and it's just great that we've got such a you know connected team with with great chemistry, and, we, and it feels like we're just we're getting closer and closer. You know, every game we play together, and you know, incorporating a guy like Chet into the team now, it's going to make my job a lot easier playing with uh, big that can stretch the floor, that can play above the rim as a lob threat. So, uh, not that throwing lobs is my forte, but um, it's awesome to have a guy like that back in the team that can uh, make the game so much easier for everybody else. Uh, you you haven't thrown a lot of lobs, so I I don't know if we have a fair sample size yeah. to judge whether or not you throw lobs or not. Hopefully it gets better. I mean, the first one I tried to throw to Chet um, in the summer, I, I threw it right off the backboard and it bounced back to me. It didn't even hit his hand. So uh, something I've got to work on and get better at. I want to go back to a little bit. You, you mentioned the freedom to make mistakes, and you don't get rattled very often, right? It seems like you're very fearless out there on the floor. Where does that come from for you? Um. I think it's always been, you know, a thing of mine not to um, not to show the other team that you know you're fatigued, you're you're frustrated, you're stressed because that gives them an advantage. Um, if they see that type of thing, they they go at it. And uh, for me, um, especially in big moments, you have to stay level headed. You can't um, you can't start doing things you haven't done all year. And um, I think that was a big thing in the playing. Uh, we we played. Uh, and that was the difference between two games. And I think the New Orleans game, we played the same way we had all year, which got it to that point. 
And the Minnesotaium, I think, myself included, we, we tried to do things that we hadn't done all year. And that's what hurt us. And um, I think in the big pressure moments, you have to stick to what's got you to that point. And, um, and we, it was a great learning experience for the guys. You know, a lot of us was our first taste of a playoff action and uh, play in, playoff, whatever you want to call it. And, um, and it would be better for us going forward now that we've had that experience you know, under our belt. So um, staying level headed is very important, not letting big moments, small moments, whatever it is, distract you um, and just continue with you know, what's got you to that point. We've mentioned the passing. Another big element of your game is your rebounding. Just how has that element of your game evolved in your time in the league? Yeah, um, rebound is something that um, it's not really a skill to say. I mean, it is in some sense for big guys, especially, you know, having to box out and go get the ball. But for a guy like myself, um, typically I'm guarding guys that aren't going to crash the old glass. So uh, my job's not too hard on the glass. I try to help the bigs out because especially when we go small ball, we need everyone in there crashing the boards. And um, I just try to make their job a little easier. And uh, rebound has always been something fun for me because it's a great way to get out in transition to start the break. And um, offensively, it gets us extra possession. So um, rebound has always been something I've, I've tried to you know, make an emphasis on. Is there any moment from maybe your rookie season that you look back on and laugh now, given the way you're able to hold your own in terms of rebounding now? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, there's a lot. I mean, I used to, as I said, I used to joke around with J-Rob about it all the time because um, you know, he would have to do all the hard work and he would be, you know, especially when we're playing those type of bigs that crash the glass, like, you know, Embiid, Jokic, whoever it was, it was Andre Drummond one. That was the funniest one because he was having a boxing bout all night and I was coming in just getting every rebound and the poor guy couldn't get one. So, um, yeah, it is fun playing with these bigs that do all the dirty work and, um, you know, it makes my job a little easier. You guys are working together. That's all that is. Exactly. We're on the same page. We're the team. <laughs> we're so working it is together. Um, switching gears a little bit. You're very self-aware when you understand your path and, and growth as, as a shooter. Mm -hmm. um, how important is it for you to see that big picture for you? Very. Um, I mean, it's something that has obviously got to get better. Um, it was something that I've spent a lot of time this summer working on and uh, me and Chip have, have spent a lot of time together and, and he's been awesome and, um, in, in that sense. And, um, and he does a great job of, uh, a lot of it's not, you know, technical. A lot of it for me was, you know, just um, confidence wise and um, going out there. And, and I think for me, the big thing was like, you know, I miss one, I worry. My percentage going up, is it going down? Whatever that may be. And um, the big thing that he emphasized to me was, um, shoot you know the, the great shooters look forward to the next shot after a miss because they know what they did wrong and they know what to clean up on and that's something that i've really that mindset something that i've embraced um over the summer and um and i think the the big thing for me is not coming into this season trying to prove to everyone that, that i'm this knocked out shooter um and, and blazing away from three now and i think just taking the right ones and that's something i did last year was just taking the right ones understanding if the defense doesn't close out shoot the ball if they do make the right read. So, um, you know, I'm smart enough to, to make the right play. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm not coming into this season trying to change the perception on my shooting and what it is. And um, yeah, I mean, if they're there to take, I'm going to shoot. I'm not going to hesitate, but um, I'm not going to come out blazing away trying to change the narrative that I'm, you know, turned into JJ Redick over the last four months. Right. Keeping the, the long view in mind. Yeah. For you all as a team over the past couple of years, you've had to show a lot of resilience in, in the face of adversity. How important is it to now have uh, you know, humility in, in the face of success. Very, um, because it's easy to get caught up um, in, in highs and lows. And um, what the best piece of advice I got is nothing's ever as good as it seems, nothing's ever as bad as it seems. And especially in a big moment, I think, um, you know, I, I keep referring, but that playing game, we came off such a high in New Orleans and a massive win um, against a really good team to keep our season alive. And then um, we come to Minnesota and it's such a low, you know, your season ends on that note. And um, it's just that it's how basketball works. There's great moments, there's bad moments and um, staying level headed and, and neutral is a really important thing. And um, yeah, I mean, this team's going to hopefully continue on the path where we are and there's going to be more success that comes with it. But not letting outside noise distract you, not letting um, outside expectations um, disrupt what we're doing internally is very important. So we've got the right guys to, that, that handle that right. You know, uh, Sam and Mark really preach that. So um, that shouldn't be a problem for our team. That, given the path that this group is on, what's it been like for you being a part of this group and growing with them kind of organically over the last couple of seasons? It's been awesome. I mean, when I came in, you know, it was a rebuilding team. It was a young group. We, we won the year before I came. They won, you know, 20 or so games. My rookie year, we won 20 or so games. And then the jump we were able to make last year was just impressive. And nobody pictured us doing what we did and getting to the point where we did. And um, it's just a testament to the group. Uh, we, we never let the outside noise and expectations bother what we were doing. And 
Um, and that's not to say this year that we're going to make another 15 game, you know, increase um, because it's not how it works. You can't, it's not never linear. It's never going to be um, a steady growth and um, there's going to be challenges. Uh, we're going to go through stretches where we're two and eight, two and seven, whatever it is, and um, just not letting those bad runs um, get the group down, get the morale of the team down. And, um, and as I said, we've got the right guys. We come into the building every day, win or lose, uh, with the same mindset of getting better and um, stacking good days. So um, that's never a worry for this team. And hopefully um, this year we can continue you know, in the right path and um, hopefully continue to um, up the win column. Switching gears a little bit, I want to talk about your hometown. I want to talk about Melbourne for a little bit. For those who've never been, can you tell us what makes Melbourne so special? Um, well, there's a lot of things, <laughs> uh, as you would know. Um, for me, it's home for me. So all my family and friends are there. Um, I think it's a massive sporting city. There's, there's, there's the AFL, there's the NBL, which is the um, basketball league in Australia over there. There's um, there's a million you know different sports going on. and in the city and um, it, it's busy. And it, for Americans, it's similar to, I think it's similar to Toronto. Um, that's kind of the way I look at Melbourne and New York, Toronto. Um, it's a very busy city, there's a lot of traffic, um, a lot of good restaurants. Um, so there's a lot to do. And for me, it's home and I love it. But I, in my opinion, it's the best city in the world. If someone was going to Melbourne for the first time and they asked your advice, what do I need to do? Where do I need to go eat? What would you tell them? Um, to eat, uh, Grati at Crown, the best restaurant. <laughs> I go there all the time. Me and my friends go there all the time. Um, to do, I mean, there's a. It, it depends when you go as well because different sporting seasons are on at different points. Um, a lot of artists started to go out there to to do concerts and things like that. So um, it's so far away from America, which is like the big downfall. But um, yeah, there, there's a million things to do. Whether you go to Melbourne, Sydney, you know. The Gold Coast, the beaches are awesome up there. Um, the weather's great during the summer. Um, nightlife's awesome. Restaurants are great. So there's, I could go on for ages about it, but it's, uh, it's, I think it's the best place in the world. The other thing that grounds you to Melbourne is the fact that you know your dad represented that team, played for the Melbourne Tigers. Do you remember when you fell in love with the game of basketball and did your dad play an influence in that? He did. Um, I mean, I was around it for, for such a long time and because he played, he's, you know, jerseys in the rafters and um, in Melbourne. And I think from a young age, I, I was around the game so much that it was inevitable that I was going to play. I, I had no idea what level I was going to play at. I always wanted to be an NBL player. And if I could have carved out a great NBL career, that was like perfect for me as a young kid. And because um, that's what I grew up watching, you know, th those type of games and players and um, and as things progressed a little better, I, I eventually got a little bit better and better and made my, made my way to the NBA. And um, But yeah, I think dad, when I got to about 15, I had to decide whether I wanted to take a scholarship offer to the NBA Academy, which is um, in Canberra, away from Melbourne. Uh, so I had to move out of home at an early age. And that was the point for me where I was like, oh, well, if I do this, I've got to go all in with basketball. And, um, and I did it. Uh, and my parents were never pushy. They, they never forced me to play a sport. Um, I always loved playing basketball, but I, as a kid, I did a million different sports and, um, yeah, I did tennis, cricket, footy, basketball. I played a bunch of different things and, um, they never pushed me one way. Um, and when I made the decision, um, to, to, to go to the NBA Academy, that's when I essentially, I said that, you know, basketball, um, I have to go all in with it and I have to, you know, give it a real shot. And clearly you made the right decision. Do you yeah. think about that often? I, I do, but at the time I made the decision to go, I was better at footy than I was at basketball. Right. But um, I, it was just, you know, to go to the NBA Academy as a kid is a, is a thing that, you know, a lot of kids around the world would, would you know, um, love to do that. And I just couldn't pass up on that opportunity. And um, I clearly took it and it worked out all right. Well, we're glad you made that yeah. decision, Josh. Thank you so much for taking the time and sitting no down problem. with us. Thank we you. appreciate it. All good. Always love hearing from Josh and great interview by Paris, of course. And uh, Michael, let's take a look at what's on tap for the Thunder, which is one more game here at home on Friday. The Phoenix Suns coming into town. One of those Friday Thunder Friday nights that we always talk about on KSBI. You can catch that game here locally, Channel 52, um, and then up in Tulsa, Channel 6.3. And, and Michael, there's something else happening. This, Like I said, we're recording on Thursday. Before the team goes out of town on this big road trip, before this game on Friday against the Suns, your alma mater, the San Diego State Aztecs, they're playing tonight against the number one overall seed, UConn Huskies. I want to get you on the record now. Now, our viewers, you're not going to see this until uh, Friday morning. So we've got Michael locked in now. What is your prediction for tonight's game against L UConn? Let me just start with this. I'm an Aztec for life. That's all. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, you know, first of all, for the program, awesome. Congratulations, because this is back-to-back -back years for them reaching this Sweet 16. And, you know, they played in the national championship game last year. It's tough to beat an Aztec twice in the same championship tournament. So I got to go with my Aztecs, you know, because not that they retired my jersey, not that I went to that school. <laughs> Just don't forget about all that, people. Just stick with what I'm saying. Aztecs will overcome the Huskies tonight. All right, we've got that locked in. While we're speaking of, of March Madness and college basketball, big shout out also to Langston University, whose men's basketball team made their very first ever uh, NIA, NAIA National Championship game, came up just short. They were the runners up, but obviously an amazing season here for Oklahoma's only HBCU. So big time shout out to the Langston Lions. Uh, so be sure to tune in on Friday night as the Thunder takes on the Suns. That big long road trip, it's the longest road trip of the season coming up after that over to the East Coast that starts in New York with stops in Philly and Boston as well following up after that. Thank you so much for tuning in. Be sure to like, rate, and subscribe wherever you get your podcast. And until next time, thunder up and catch you later.